this task facing our new mayor and council in 2015 and beyond. A reminder, we provide in excess of 100 services. This slide doesn't show very well, but the bottom line is that when you walk out the street, you are probably looking at anywhere from 10 to 15 services that are directly related to a city. Whether it's transit, highways, roads, emergency services, water, wastewater, and social services, and of course many of them 24-7. Quick budget overview. Since 2000, the city annual capital budget has tripled. When I first started the city in 2002, the capital plan was less than $10 billion, was somewhere around 5 or $6 billion. Needless to say, we needed a lot of financing and put the plans together for the replacement, replacement of our infrastructure. We've already made major strides in the last six or seven years, spent in the range of about $50 billion, and we have a capital plan from 2014 to 2023 of nearly $30 billion. Nearly half of it, about $14 billion, of course, is transit and transportation. Some of the projects, 150 new subway cars to come, not just the ones you see, 307 new buses, 195 light rail vehicles, Union Station revitalization, a great partnership with our, our federal and provincial partners, Gardner Expressway rehab. Of course, the Scarborough subway and the Toronto York Spadina subway extension are two notable growth-related projects included in that budget, both of which have provincial and federal fund funding contributions. The other program area, not enough uh, notice, Toronto Water. $9 billion capital program, and I believe we're looking at the, in terms of the 2015 to 2024 plan, now 10 to $11 billion, all funded from rates, no debt. Services delivered, six largest government, as you've already heard, $11 billion. Social programs, 25% of the, of the donut, I can't say pie. Uh, TTC and transportation, about 20% of our expenditures, emergency services, police, fire, and paramedic services, 15%. Toronto Water, again, 1 billion, 13% of our gross expenditures. And most importantly, I want to note with some of the banks in the room, we are paying principal and interest on debt with only 6% of those expenditures. This is compared to, as you know, 20% plus for provincial and federal budgets that only pay interest, not principal and interest, that we do. Where does the money come from? City operating funding, of course, primarily property taxes. However, the city does utilize large user fee revenues for rate-supported programs that total about 30% now of our funding, and that includes 16% for the water and solid waste management and 11% of the user fees coming from transit and the TTC. Also, need to highlight that we receive about 17% of our revenues from the province of Ontario for our social service partnership services. This slide is one that I get nervous showing because I still have strong partnership relationships with my colleagues at the province. However, our structural deficit is not going away. And I speak to our operating funds. The 2000 download of provincial social services, social housing, transit, put a burden up in excess of $300 million of additional pressures on Toronto at the time. At this point, the 2015 budget challenge that we're working on diligently as we speak, uh, we have additional pressures of about $120 million from further provincial funding, of, uh, funding cuts of social housing that occurred in 2014. Given our existing f fiscal situation with inflating expenditures and revenue forecasted, you see this $320 million uh, shortfall that has been projected by our CFO. So with all those challenges, although I jumped up to 2015, I do want to highlight the fact that in 2005, we did put together uh, a long-term fiscal plan that included what we believe was the long-term solution to fiscal sustainability for the City of Toronto. We knew that 
simple approaches needed to be very strong, control expenditures, notwithstanding the fact that our social services are significant in, the, in Toronto relative to the GTA, so you know 90% of public housing in the Greater Toronto Area is in the City of Toronto. 75% of Ontario's public housing is in the City of Toronto. So we have expenditure social service challenges. On the revenue side, we knew we had to grow and diversify our revenues with a view to keeping the city affordable for residents and businesses. And on the asset and liability side, is existing assets required state of good repair, which required the significant infrastructure replacement programs, which, which were starting to happen in 2005, but needed to be enhanced and grown along with some employee benefit liabilities. I won't bore you with that detail. But the plan was developed, approved by council, moved on to address these key, this key operating uh, deficit that we had. And a lot has occurred. I could have 12 slides on each of the areas of expenditures, revenues, and assets and liabilities. I'm gonna to try to summarize what has occurred. An important piece of the revenue side in 2007 the province agreed to the City of Toronto Act. We are the only city, of course, in Ontario that has its own act. And with that, we did have some limited new tax authorities to diversify and grow our revenues. Capital infrastructure pressures are being recognized by the provincial and federal governments, which have committed billions of transit partnership funding. Partnership with Metrolinx is huge and working very well. The combination of 2011 to 14 expenditure reductions was the key to fixing the expenditure cost side of our long-term plan. $350 million of expenditure reductions in the 2012, 13, and 14 budgets. A labor settlement that saved $140 million at the same time. Council also, back in 2005, approved a business tax reduction plan to reduce business taxes that were as high as four times the residential rate to reduce it to two and a half times. We are already at three times, well on our way to two and a half times by 2020. I believe, and I've heard loud and clear from many of the businessmen in this room and, and outside uh, in downtown Toronto that our, our property tax plan was one thing that did assist in the revitalization of our commercial uh, office towers in downtown Toronto today. Obtaining dedicated predictable funding for transit, however, is still one of our two keys to long-term fiscal sustainability. As we all know, the TTC is a system congested at peak hours and ridership continues to grow annually as more and more residents of both Toronto and the surrounding municipalities rely on the TTC to get to key employment centers, especially downtown. We must move quickly with our colleagues at the province and Metrolinx to build the $8.4 billion Wave 1 of Move Ontario by 2020 to 2022. Most importantly, on the operating side, the province needs to revisit partnership funding with all cities in Ontario related to a 50-50 share of the cost in order to ensure we don't, we are not forced to annual fare increases. Housing is the other major Toronto and Canadian municipal pressure. Two years ago when I spoke at the U of T, I called the issue our smoking gun and it still hasn't been addressed. Today for Toronto, it is basically as large a budgetary pressure as transit. For capital, left-hand side, $2.6 billion is needed over the next 10 years because we are verging on a health and safety issue that you see invariably once a week on the news with a real possibility of moving tenants out of uninhabitable units. The city has requested one-third partnership funding for that $2.6 billion, and we are already moving on our share of about $900 million. The city does not have enough revenue, though, to fund the major income redistribution program of housing on its own. Yes, Toronto and Ontario municipalities can deliver social services on behalf of the province and the federal governments, 
but social housing funding must be at a minimum cost shared by all levels of government. Put simply, social programs such as social housing are more appropriately funded by income tax and sales tax versus property taxes. That's well known, well researched, and articulated. It has to happen sooner rather than later. And it's the same source of funding that occurs in all other global cities. This slide indicates that. This is from studies done at the U of T. All large global cities have revenue options that grow with the economy, like income, sales, or corporate tax. And there's a simple reason. The 21st century city is providing services, social and infrastructure, that are needed that is far beyond the 19th century property tax tool. While the rest of the world has been sharing all taxes with large cities for 25 plus years, and I emphasize sharing, not necessarily increasing taxes, Canada and Ontario remain slow to share revenues. Berlin's revenue options include inheritance tax, believe it or not, tax on lottery, and of course in Berlin, a beer tax. New York City's revenue options include sales, income, cigarette, cigarettes, parking, amongst a, a number of others. As you see in the bottom, they have 16 more. They have about 20 revenue options in New York City and about 25 in Berlin. And that's just two examples out of about 20 that we've got that we uh, compare to on a regular basis. So in summary, the scorecard from the 05 fiscal plan has been updated annually to council. And as of 2014, this is the way that it looks. In summary, we've made major strides, no ifs, ands, or buts, in meeting our 2005 long-term fiscal plan and, and close to achieving financial sus uh, sustainability to support our strategic actions. On the expenditure side, we have made significant measures to reduce spending by hundreds of millions of dollars that I referred to earlier, including the verification of our expenditures by service with benchmarking in Ontario, Canada, and now the world that I'll speak to in a few minutes. On the revenue side, we have also taken measures to protect our revenue base and increase it. However, we still need new revenues that grow with the economy to meet our continued population growth and infrastructure needs. And on the asset and liability side, we've been focusing on the 10-year plan that you, you saw earlier. Uh, we will, by the end of this 10-year plan, have most of our assets in a state of good repair. The water plan, within the 10 years, will in effect have something like three or only three or four percent of our infrastructure that will be, be uh, more than 50 years old. Roads, hopefully the same thing, highways, etc. The Gardner, in the next 12 to 13 years, we hope that it will be totally re rehabilitated. Bottom line is, what's positive is, with the debt financing that has increased in order to meet these challenges, we still have maintained our double A plus credit rating. So that's enough of the history and, some, and a lot of the financing related to where we are today. I do want to take a few minutes to talk about the future and our strategic actions. Council approved back uh, after amalgamation in 2002 a strategic plan that in a report we sent to council, uh, we implemented all of the 18 strategic directions that were approved at the time. In 2013, I initiated a strategic plan update which council approved that lays out a framework for the city over the next five years. The strategic plan sets out council's vision, mission, and of course specific goals that guide the planning activities within the organization. I'll, pro I'll provide you some quick highlights on the key themes and strategic actions uh, that you see there. Uh, under the theme of city building, we must and will refine a long-term transportation plan and policies to reduce congestion. Under economic vitality, we will continue to create a more attractive business climate to encourage business growth and investment and foster job creation. Under the theme of environmental sustainability, we will advance on the tree canopy and a long-term solid waste management strategy. Under the theme of social development, we will support affordable housing through the continued implementation of our 10-year housing plan and Housing Opportunities Toronto. And under the theme of good governance, we will enhance the city's performance measurement and continue to improve 
customer service. That's just a snapshot. Again, detailed reports and actions are happening. Rather than calling this these strategic directions, I purposely call them strategic actions because we want to implement these actions as soon as possible. The last strategic theme I'm going to cover is fiscal sustainability. In the next year, the city will undertake an update of the long-term fiscal plan that is now 10 years old. Financing the city's growth will continue to be a key action. The 2015 long-term fiscal plan will seek to align with the city's official plan and develop an integrated approach to finance growth. Implementing a renewed corporate-wide strategic asset management plan by improving the coordination and sequencing of capital projects and enhancing partnerships and funding from other levels of government to ensure we do truly have a state of good repair. We'll also improve service and financial planning by aligning budgetary and performance service and refining our fiscal reporting to council and the public. That to some degree sounds a little bureaucratic and boring. The bottom line is we have the plans and the policies in place to move us forward beyond 2015. I do want to highlight somewhat of a bureaucratic term, benchmarking. During our years of struggle with our property tax and, and cutbacks and asking for money from the province, we we're all, all always challenged in terms of, but we know you've got waste at the city. With the reductions that we made in 12, 13, and 14, I know full well that our costs are competitive with anyone. What you don't know is the City of Toronto, Ontario municipalities have been involved with what's called AMBI, an Ontario Municipal Benchmarking Initiative, for 10 years. And it actually was started by the province in concert with municipalities, and it's been a huge success. So in this AMBI group of 16 municipalities in Ontario, we benchmarked 600 performance measures in 36 service areas with the goal to identify best practices amongst municipalities in all service areas. We've gotten the reputation. What happened? The World Bank came to the U of T and said in 2005, why don't you start up an institute so that we can start actually collecting data across the globe with large cities. It's happening. This work culminated in May 2015 with the release of a new international standard. We all have dealt with ISOs in the past, Believe it or not, we have an ISO for service standards in cities that has just been recently uh, announced and will be officially announced in London in a few weeks. That's London, England. The work, uh, sorry, the, the World Council on City Data was formed at the same time, comprised of Toronto and 19 other large international cities across all co continents who have committed to shared service data to ultimately learn from one another. I spoke to about 30 world cities in the summer of 2015, in May, about all of these programs. So through our work in Ontario, Canada, and internationally, Toronto is seen as literally a leader in benchmarking and performance reporting. You have, from my viewpoint, a high level of efficiency within city operations. Always room for improvement, but we're there. Next few slides are slides that don't get enough press. When I said that you see the media gives you the press that they want to provide. They don't talk about international rankings that usually come out about once every month or two months. The internal migration to live, work, and locate business in Toronto is a reflection of both the high quality of life and economic opportunity provided by the city and the greater Toronto area. With the 2014 to 18 strategic actions for the future, we want to build on the city's past success in international rankings. A sampling of the recent international rankings, some of, of which are before you there, we are invariably in the top five of key rankings. From number one, as believe it or not, the most tax competitive city, KPMG study, in the world, to number two for business investment in North America, to the leading banking system that we all know worldwide, a leader in labor attractiveness and livability. While 10 to 15 years ago in these rankings, we we're in the top 10 to 20, we, as I said earlier, are now consistently in the top five. The city of Toronto has matured as the fourth largest city in North America. We have grown 
not just in population, but economically, socially, culturally, environmentally, and importantly, as the most diverse population in North America and indeed the world. As a result of our reputation, continue, as a result, our reputation continues to be at the top of world cities, inclusive of being top in the world for resiliency, a top city of opportunity, and consistently in the top for livability. So in conclusion, I am winding down. There is a need for greater collaboration amongst municipalities to address these common transit and housing issues facing the greater Toronto and Hamilton area and Ontario municipalities. We have, we have planned transportation strategies and service plans to meet our growth challenges. However, we cannot meet these transportation challenges without the continued partnerships, partnership support from the provincial and federal governments. I must be clear that we may have made huge major strides in partnership funding on infrastructure in particular over the last 10 years. We have, and the provincial and federal governments have come to the table and are true partners. Most especially the strong support from the province by moving on $10 billion in transit expansion over the next 10 years within the city of Toronto. And with another billion plus, hopefully, from 2020 to 2030. The province has listened and moved on our need for transit infrastructure expansion. And I believe the outstanding future capital needs will be met through, I hope, enhanced federal commitments to transit in cities across Canada. We must convince the federal and provincial governments to take back responsibility, however, in social housing. It is not a municipal responsibility from my viewpoint. With these transit and housing funding partnerships, again similar to other global cities, we will then be able to manage our transit growth, our housing pressures, and provide the, need, and provide the needed flexibility to address all of our core city building service initiatives and opportunities. Now a bit of my personal sermon. While municipalities have come a long way in the past 25 years as partners with the other levels of government, partnership funding changes have been slow. When I began my municipal, municipal career about a thousand years ago, our municipal government was referred to, and I think councillors will even know this, as the third level of government. When in discussion with the federal government staff colleagues at that time were often referred to along with the provincial governments, so both of us, provincial and municipal, as the sub-national levels of government. This mindset resulted in the past service and funding downloading related to federal and provincial budget shortfalls and deficits, and this occurred not just in Canada, but across the world. However, I believe the maturity of municipalities and urban centers across Ontario and Canada in the past 10 to 15 years has resulted in a, what I call, one governmental paradigm shift. The municipal level of government that delivers the majority of services to residents and businesses across Canada is now respected as the most experienced level of government to meet residents' needs. We are now respected for our professionalism in managing public services and are now treated more fairly and equally as government partners, most especially with the province of Ontario with the establishment of the City of Toronto Act. We are no longer third class, but invited to the table with the other levels of government to meet our common challenges to serve our common taxpayers, residents, and businesses, and I emphasize common. The quote, one government paradigm shift as I call it, must continue to mature and foster with a new enhanced legislative framework. And I hope a revitalized City of Toronto Act in the next term of council to refine our service roles and responsibilities, and at the same time, come up with a long-term committed funding plan for all of our services. <clears throat> the key steps in stabilizing municipal funding in Ontario is through the transit and housing realignment and the upcoming review of the City of Toronto Act. And that is the key opportunity we have with the province. So we do have, I believe, as I wind down, a strategic plan update. We have service plans for all of our major programs. We have an updated official plan very close to fruition in 2015. 
a long-term updated financial plan that will occur shortly, a double A plus credit rating that we have and will continue to have with the plan that we have in front of us for the next 10 years. But we must now begin to think as a global city leader, which we are. And, and building on today's strong foundation to reach the Toronto strategic vision of being our vision of caring, friendly, clean, green, and sustainably dynamic city that invests in quality of life. To reach this vision, you must work with other levels of government early in the new term to achieve our joint vision to provide an economically vibrant and importantly social, socially inclusive city that will be number one in the Americas to live, work, and play. I do know that our new mayor-elect has outlined this partnership as a key objective, and I'm more than optimistic that with the United Mayor and Council, support of provincial and federal governments combined with enhanced business and community partnerships, we can all work together to invest and grow one Toronto, as the mayor-elect would say in 2015 and beyond, that we all can be proud of. Thank you very much. I want to ask a question. When you went through your presentation and it's clear uh, of your concerns over the uh, ability to f uh, sustain the fiscal health in the city, um, if you were the premier of the province, what would you be doing to ensure that their budget would be balanced but also being able to help the city of Toronto. I'm not retired yet. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I was clear, and I have been clear in discussions with my colleagues at the province, deputy ministers, that, and everybody agrees, that social housing really should not be 100% funded by municipalities. It's the issue of uh, the capability of financing at the provincial and federal levels. I'm hoping with where the federal position is this year and next year, that the ball could start with the federal government to open up some funding for social housing that would then be passed on to the province, that would, that would then be passed on to municipalities, hence my term, one government. And we've got common taxpayers and Yes, we all have fiscal challenges, but if we have some available funding with some potential surpluses in the near future in the federal level, let's work together to get that funding expedited to assist our social housing dilemma. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, um, I'd like to invite Bert Clark to, to join me on the po at the podium. Uh, Bert is the President and CEO of Infrastructure Ontario and an Empire Club Director, and he will thank our speaker today. Joe, thank you for those insights. Um, I also want to take the opportunity to thank you for more than, uh, I thought it was only 35 years, but a thousand years of public service. It's quite impressive. <laughs> um, I don't know that people appreciate the complexity of the job that you held for the last six years. Uh, Ten billion dollar budget, two and a half million people. City government, as you pointed out, touches everybody in tangible ways on a daily basis. Garbage collection, affordable housing, building permits, water sewer, public transit, and so on. When those things aren't working, people notice. And the last four years were objectively quite tumultuous at City Hall. Uh, and through it, you were unflappable. Uh, you stayed focused on managing. And you made sure that essential public services were not affected by that uh, tumult. And that was no small task. And for that, the city owes you a great debt. Thank you, Joe. I'd like to uh, close by thanking our very generous sponsors. Our event sponsor today is Toronto Portlands Company. Thank you. Um, our student table sponsors are Bell Canada,
Tom, Thomas McCaig International and the Toronto Port Authority. I'd also like to thank the National, po National Post, excuse me, as our print media sponsor. This meeting will be broadcast on Rogers TV. We're very grateful to them for the support. Uh, you can follow us on, on Twitter at Empire underscore Club and visit us online at www.empireclub.org. Thank you all for coming. Uh, we hope to see you again soon at some of the exciting upcoming events that are advertised on your table. Please join us. Thank you. This meeting is now adjourned.